trap. Hello and welcome to Be Real, the Maryland real estate podcast. I'm Brad Cox with the Vesta Group of Long and Foster, and I am joined by my partner in crime, <laughs> Michael Becker. I'm sorry for the little laugh there, Brad. I'm used to using <laughs> crazy very ver- adjectives, verbose adjectives, well, verbose isn't right, sesquipedalian. Yeah, I've been used yeah, that yeah. term more than once. Thought I'd simplify a you little bit. You are a lover today. of long words. I am, yeah, sure. Well, English major roots, what can I tell you? So, Michael, we got. We have we. I don't know if it's real. What's real? Because you know, it. This is the be this real. Is be podcast, real, right? So it is. Real. But I was looking at our metrics. We got somebody downloading us in Belgium. Cool. It's yeah. But I, I mean, I know a couple of people in Belgium from my days in software. But where in Belgium? Brussels. No. Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking Best of... chocolate in the world, Mary Chocolatier in Brussels, Belgium. Maybe that's who's... Definitely. That must be it. <laughs> but anyway, so hey, shout out to Belgium. That's kind of cool. Pretty wild, yeah. Now, or it could be somebody's crazy VPN settings or yeah, I yeah, don't know. Yeah, yeah. That's true. <laughs> or, it's our, or it's our friend who works in one of the alphabet agencies who has a, a you know, <laughs> sure her location is spoofed. <laughs> gotcha. Well, the more, the merrier uh, this application, I mean, the information we give is is germane to the local real estate market yeah but i think it even though the you know um international mortgages are a little different than they are in the united states very different a 30-year fix is is unique that's yeah the that's, that's people only have adjustable US. rate mortgages right but the advice that we give i'd like to think is kind of universal yeah yeah so. uh, great point great point all right well michael so we're gonna roll right in today we're gonna really try to make an episode definitely under 60 minutes. We've said, you know, we've gotten close, right, where we've said, hey, if you exclude the music, it we're under just... 60 minutes. Let's push this time to well, really I, get under know, 60, but, and still deliver we've been great putting out, There's a lot of information we've since we started this that we had to get out. Yes. As we get more developed and seasoned in our podcasting, perhaps we can tighten up the coverage of the details. Maybe it'll come down to us just talking about things that came up during our work week, and they may um, provide some insight to the people who are downloading and listening to this. Yeah. When I did the radio show, mm-hmm. often it was something that came up during that week, and one of the best responses, now radio show was immediate because some, we could invite callers to call, right in. call yeah. right in and talk to us, mm-hmm. and the best uh, calls I ever got were when somebody would call up, hey, you know that scenario you're just talking about on the radio? That's, that's me. me. I'm that right. guy. <laughs> yeah. What do I do? Right. Perfect. And that's what we want to do because we've seen, I wouldn't say we've seen it all, but we've seen a lot of it. We have seen a lot. Right? Yeah. We have, uh, what, although, we're pushing something 40 new years day. of experience if you add us up all together. So. Yeah. 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 So we are seasoned veterans in the real estate and mortgage. Well, that's, that's, that's what I like to call it with my gray beard, seasoned. <laughs> <laughs> Very, anyway, very, all right. Well, well, so Michael, you got some mortgage numbers for yeah, us. Yeah, I wish I had better news, but it kind of makes sense. It seems like mortgage applications are going to be driven from here on out by interest rates. Yeah, so sure. mortgage applications decreased 8.8% from one week earlier. Last week it was up 53 Last week we saw rates driving Had now, a little rally. Yep. The dec- decrease is for the week ending April 14th. It's a little after that when we're recording that. So, And rates after this, after April 14th, continue to rise. So I wouldn't be surprised if next week's show, when the numbers come out, we see another decrease in mortgage applications. I do think that we're at the top end of the range. Yeah. Well, for mortgage rates, we it can seems, hope. To, seems to be range bound. Well, they've the ten-year Treasury is what we always look to because it's a benchmark number, and it does seem to be stuck between a channel of three point four and three point six. It, when it gets above three point six, it tends to rally a little bit down, and it has a hard time breaking three point four percent. Yeah, uh, that does mean that there can be quarter point differences in your mortgage rate from one week to the next, and people are kind of interest rate sensitive. Yes, so. I do think uh, is if when mortgage rates drop, people increase their application, which seems odd to me given the fact that you, especially in a purchase market, which we are in, yeah. and it was actually last week, it was 8.8% down, but it was purchase index was down 10%. Mm. So uh, it seems that people tend to, 
I guess I, I guess it, the definition is an application. Is an application taken when you have all six items, which means the property address that an offer has been submitted. Right. Because otherwise, it's just a pre-qualification or a pre-approval. Right. At that point. Right. So maybe that's what it is. When rates dip a little bit, people are, feel better about going ahead and making that offer and getting that offer accepted. Right. Right. Looking forward, like I said, my vote on Bankrate.com was for higher rates. I wasn't sure of that. I didn't have a lot of confidence in it. It was more of a reverse psychology <laughs> vote, as terrible as that may sound. Yeah. Uh, Does it I, work? Has that ever worked? It I'm works curious. every time. Wow. All right. Well, not every time, but it seems yeah. like it to me. So all I have to do is predict rates to go higher if I want them to go down. So yeah. I, every week I suspect I should just vote for Just vote higher. for them to go up. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. If, well, if I did that every week, it probably wouldn't work out. But yeah, probably not. It did. Once I submitted that vote on Friday, uh, rates rallied just a little, just a little bit. And it seems like we're recording this later than normal on a Monday. Yeah. Because of something that you had to do. But they seem to be rallying a little bit today. So, But I do think we're going to be range-bound in the— we until something happens to break us out of it, there are no Fed officials that have speeches. That's what made Fed was it, Fed officials over the last couple of weeks were just pounding the Fast table and on inflation. Furious. Yeah, we got to kill inflation. We got to kill inflation. So right. rates were going up. They're thinking they're going to be a little hawkish. Uh, there are no speeches by Fed officials. This is the blackout period leading to the beginning of May. Right, Fed. Uh, meeting so for the next week or so, I think we're going to be range bound and probably flat. Even though I voted for higher rates, <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll take it. I'll take it. Flat is flat is better than up. So Here, can I say something? It's a great point. It is better than it's up. So one of the issues we have is limited supply out there, and you're going to talk about that. And yeah. I have a speculation out there, and I think that a lot of um, people who might sell. Uh, a lot of people say they're stuck because they have low rates. I don't know that that's the case for some people if they don't have to move. But there's there's quality of life decisions, there's retirement decisions, there's change of life, there's downsizing, and all those things that aren't driven by interest rates it's per se. Right. Volatility in interest rate does drive that. The ups and downs of interest rates got sellers a little scared maybe to list their homes because you know just when they're figuring out what they might be able to afford or they're doing a little legwork on their own before they list their house and then all of a Ooh, sudden yeah. two weeks later rates are a half big point spike. higher big spike right that'll that scares people a little bit the rapidity of that yes escalation is just yeah that's I said the to thing you, that's during the entire time of COVID, when the fed was offering out um a lot of support to mortgage rates yeah we probably saw a quarter point over a quarter point maybe three eighths change in total over, over the, a year and a half period. Right. And, and we now see we that can in a see, week or two. We can see those changes in a week or so. Yeah. Yeah. So, anyway, sorry for that uh, no, no, editorial. No. Great, great, great perspective. And and I think it's something that people just, they need to keep in mind. So, yeah, I, yeah, I think that's helpful. Thank you, Michael. Yeah. All right. So let's let's go right into the, uh, the last seven days for the real estate market. Let's talk about market activity. Active listings. We had 336 active listings over the last seven days, 298 two weeks ago. So that's an, that's an increase of 12.75%. Pending listings went up 15.91% from 811 two weeks ago to 940 this week. So we've sold off a little bit more inventory. Settled, closed volume went up 22.52% from two weeks ago, 453 to 555. So we had a lot of increase in, in numbers and volume. It's, it, historically speaking, as you move later into the month, don't close. Yeah, typically this is a seasonal yeah. adjustment to what, we, what we'd normally like to see. And then properties that went off the market, that increased a little bit, but 7.08% up from 226 two weeks ago to 242 this week. So that's it's not a huge difference. The, the numbers that go into that are the ones that are either temporarily off, they're withdrawn, they're expired, or they're canceled. I will say the expired listings, we had about 67 expired listings. So that's it's not a huge number just shows that we're selling through that inventory pretty well and property listings tend not to be expiring. All right, the average days on the market relatively flat down almost 1% from 31.4 to 31.1. 
The median days on the market down 14.29%, but that's almost irrelevant too, down from seven to six. Okay. Your total volume, sales volume, up 48.1% from 168.9 million up to 250.1 million. Wow. Yeah, that's so it's a lot of increase in volume, and again, this is the this is the time of the year that we start to see those increases. So that's that's not Makes sense. surprising. The number of concessions correspondingly went up uh, about forty point eight percent instead of forty eight percent from one twenty five to one seventy six. But the percent getting increases also increased a little bit by almost fifteen percent. From twenty-seven point five nine percent two weeks ago to thirty-one point seven one percent this week. Now that think- could be any number of things, but I don't think. Again, I still don't believe that's upfront seller help. So you're saying that's you've condition always, of the property. This issues. is post contract, post home inspection. Yeah, concessions by the seller. Yep. Rather than having the seller repair something, they just give a little concession. Correct. Right, Makes rather sense. than getting the seller help up front Makes sense. as part of the, the negotiated deal up front. All right, the list-to-sold ratio mm-hmm. was up 1.6% overall when you include auctions, 102.06 last two weeks ago to 103.77 this week. We had a a relatively stable a number of auctions that closed this past week, mm-hmm. uh, about 11. But when you remove the auctions, it's really down a half, not even a half a percent, uh, five one hundredths of a percent from 99.93 to 99.88. So still relatively close to what listing agents are putting out there as the listing price. And then the median sold sales price. Again, we've talked about this before. We see fluctuations in this on the seven day all the time. Doesn't mean that it's a trend. We went from 372 two weeks ago down this week to 360. That's a 3.23% decrease in the median sold sales price. Doesn't mean that that's a trend yet, but we always keep our eye on that to see what's happening there. So that's the. That's the gist of what's going on in the real estate market. Yep. The takeaway, I think, for buyers, you know, okay. they're going to watch the rate. They are. Yes. But sellers, too, might watch rates. If I think if rates rallied a little bit and became more stable, you might see an increase in listings. A welcomed increase in uh, listings. It would be. Now, having said that, how do you relate that to buyers? Because buyers, some buyers get sticker shock. Once they're given an actual payment for a house they're interested in, Mm -hmm. it can happen because rates are higher. Probably it starts because they go to a website like, well, I won't (laughs) mention any, but those places that give you a monthly payment are not realistic. First of all, they are lower rates than you probably, you probably pay points to get the rate that they use. And they very often strip out taxes and insurance and just give you a Or have a 20% down or have a very low amount included for those amounts. And it makes it look better. And then when when I tell some, somebody looks on a website like that and sees 3,000, 3,100 for a housing payment, and I tell them it's 3,500, that's when the sticker shot um, kicks in. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. anyway, if well, if proof rates would increase, the problem is with buyers now, if they wait for rates to improve, then the competition is just going to go up. Maybe we'll get yeah. some more listings, but competition will. I don't think that you're going to get, it's not going to switch. If rates drop, we're not going to see it go from a seller's market to a, to buyer's, a buyer's market. market. Has no. that ever happened in history? I don't think so. No, probably and not. It probably won't yeah. now. Yeah. So. All right. Well, great information, Michael. Thank you. When we come back, we're going to get into the scoop where we're talking about lemonade from lemons renovating your home before selling. So we'll be back in just a minute. And we're back to Be Real, the Maryland Real Estate Podcast. I'm Brad Cox with the Vesta Group of Long and Foster, and I am sitting right across from... Michael Becker of Sierra Pacific Mortgage. I'm not sure that I said that in the first segment. 
We got no, I said my it. name, but I'm not sure I said my company. Oh. But my name is more important. My company well, is important. But that is also important. Knowing who I am is the most important. Well, you know that in real estate, if we do any kind of advertising and we don't list our brokerage information, we are in big trouble. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So Long and Foster is our broker. Nick D'Ambrosia, love you. You're a great guy. <laughs> He's your broker of He's record. He's our broker of record. Gotcha. Yes. yes. All right, so this week... Lemonade from lemons. Yes. How to how to renovate that home before you sell it. I and I don't want to make it it's a little tongue in cheek, right? I'm not saying that your house is a lemon. No. <laughs> I'm not trying to I'm not trying to say that no, at all. No, the reason this is important is because it seems like the houses that go quick, that get multiple offers. Yep, yep, yep. That have top dollar, that have escalation clauses, that waive home inspections, that the buyers who do all kinds of crazy things mm-hmm. are those turnkey homes. The ones that are move in ready, the HGTV ready that we always talk about. Yep. So they're the ones that get So it makes sense to think about this. It th- it doesn't have to happen. There definitely are returns on investments involved with this and there's also the headache of rehabbing your home, but it's something to consider. Yep. Specifically if you've listed a house in the past and it hasn't sold, which is hard to think, but there are some homes occasionally you'll go out there and you'll see listings have been sitting for a while and they're usually in tougher condition right. and they're priced a little too high correct and it's all that's all a factor so there's some people out there who think you just in this market since it's such a seller's market just list anything and throw a price on it and somebody will buy it sure. it's not necessarily it's not, the case. not true yeah there are homes that sit for for quite a while all right well so let's talk about things some of the consider. things that you should consider when you're trying to decide whether this makes sense right because the seller's goals i think is there that's one of the big things that should come into play when you're trying to make this decision. Yeah, every seller's different. If it's an estate and it's somebody who's inherited a property, may not they just want a quick turnaround and sell that. They may not care about hitting top and dollar. And the estate may not have money to make repairs or what have you. And there may be multiple siblings who have to weigh in on that decision and they can't agree. All sorts of things that can happen there. You're but, right, absolutely. And the other end of the sale. spectrum is a young s- s- people who've bought a house, lived in it for a while, looking to upgrade their home, and they want to maximize top dollar when they sell the house, so they may consider rehabbing. Yeah, that. absolutely. And it doesn't necessarily. Here's the other thing to keep in mind: if you're thinking maybe we're going to sell down the road, a year or two down the road, make the updates now and enjoy them. I said that to you because you know you're never going to. It's very rare. You're going to get a dollar for dollar return unless you somehow are very skilled and do some of the work yourself. Sure. Dollar for dollar return on home improvements. So why not improve the home, enjoy it for a bit, and it while it's still relatively updated, you're still going to get top dollar. What when did things start getting old in listing parlance? You know, people who have a house to list if they've updated a bathroom or a kitchen, when does it start getting old? Well, it depends on where you are in the country. If okay. you're in California, it's five minutes. If you're here. <laughs> Because they, yeah. because what happens out west tends to kind of migrate this way, they can right? Keep it out so, west. yeah. But so, yeah. If you're in, if you're in LA, you have a different conversation. Talk to somebody out there. But out here, yeah. I mean, if it's been updated within the past several years, you're fine. Okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. So let's talk about the seller goals. If you want to maximize that net, yep. that that can be a big factor. That can push you to make those updates more. If you want to sell faster. That may influence you to make the repairs. You mean time it's listed. So yes. if you're gonna if you if you have a pre listing appointment, you have it, and you just suggest they do it, you're certainly not gonna list it while the re- rehab's going right. on. You're gonna right. list it after it's fixed up. Right. But okay. the whole sell faster thing also factors in that time of the repair. So if you know if you're hitting the market, you just want it to be on the market for a short period of time, that updated home makes a lot of sense. But if you have to absorb the cost, the time of how long that renovation is going to take, and it depends on who you're going to have do that work and what their schedule is and you know how you get all the contractors lined up, that can make a big difference because that, that can extend out the amount of time you have. And so if you need to sell sooner, you may not be able to make those extensive updates. And it also has to do with timing issues when it comes to listing and houses selling. There's certain periods of the year the house sells faster or there's more interest in your homes than other times of years. Yep. Uh, people tend to want to be in a new home prior to the school year starting. Yep. Homes show very well in the spring and always we always talk about a spring buying season. Right. Uh, uh, so that you have to factor those 
consideration. That you do. And uh, the people will buy homes year round. Year round. Now right? it's not it like there's seasons. To be, and it used to be that it was more seasonal. It's right. still seasonal to an extent because there's just still this ongoing mindset. But people buy year round. So don't feel like if you can't hit the spring market, you've missed your opportunity. That's not true. But you have to factor that in. So if you're thinking, of, you know, if you if you have a house that you've got to sell and you're going to sell it fairly quickly, you may or may not have time to make those updates. Correct. The other thing is, it's all it's also your appetite and your 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 degree of tolerance for the the upset. If you're especially if you're living in the home while you're getting it ready for the repair. A major for the, bath for the sale. rehab means there's one bathroom for the entire family to share off. Right, of. that right. can be uh, problematic. Can be a challenge. It's not fun in my Right. So if you need that that no fuss, no muss kind of process, then maybe making the updates aren't for you. Right. Stick to simpler things like painting (laughs) or something like that. Right. Right. The other the other things to consider, do you have enough cash available? Now there may be some options that we'll get to in a little bit about how you can do that. Right, right, to finance them. But if you have the cash that's available, usually and I think Michael, you mentioned this on the break, that, that the Probably the best way to go is if you can self-fund it, yeah. right? You oh, don't yeah. have to absorb any other financing costs. Well, there's or... costs, that costs and time involved with yeah, getting absolutely. financing. Yeah, absolutely. Right. And the other aspect is how much equity do you have in the home? Does it make sense to make the updates? Do you have enough? Because you you're going to t- spend some money. Yep. Okay. So once you've considered those factors, if you decide to move forward, the other things that you need to think about is your return on investment, Right. You know, I'm looking at this list here, and one thing you have missing yeah, is... It's not exhaustive, so that's cool. Well, you have kitchen, bathroom, ex- exterior, curb appeal. They're all very yeah. important things and people, things that generally use. Right. But it's been my... Uh, and uh, my research has shown yeah. that the greatest return on investment is expanding living areas. Well, that's true. That's you know, true. Adding an addition or making... Well, it, or depends, maybe, on, it, it depends on the addition, right? right? If you put a, a whole addition on the back of the house... You, that's not going to get you back 100%. It's going to cost a lot. But, but if you have an attic space that you can convert into another bedroom or area a basement or into area, an office or something like that. Basement that you can finish and make a bedroom, a spare bedroom, put a bathroom some, down there. Yeah, some of those kinds of things can family have. Family room. Yeah, right. some of those can have a little bit more impact. But yeah, let's but let's stick to. Kitchens, bathrooms. Yeah, kitchens, perfect. bathrooms, is the exterior. So here's the thing. If you're going to do major renovations, mm-hmm. it's a it's a question mark because the eva- the the potential to get a full return on investment, unless, to your point earlier, if you're an investor or somebody like that who's going to do the work themselves, or they've got a partner who's willing to do this work for a very slim margin with a an expectation of uh, a payback at the end, unless you're doing it that way, it, it can cost a, a pretty penny. To get some of this work done, so and you're also lim- the the return on investment is what you're saying is yeah. lesser for the major upgrades as yeah. opposed to minor upgrades to kitchens, yeah, and bathrooms and yeah, stuff. absolutely. So if you look at a kitchen renovation, just a minor renovation, but let's let's talk about what a minor renovation would be. That's like, uh, you know, maybe replacing the cabinet fronts and the hardware or painting them. Maybe replacing the countertops and installing maybe some new appliances. If you're doing a major kitchen remodel, that's you're going to replace the cabinets, replace the countertops, the appliances, the flooring. You might be moving plumbing. So we're distinguishing between the degrees of effort when we make these percentages of return on investment. So Remodeling Magazine puts out this cost versus value report every year. And the 2022 cost versus value report showed, and there's national, but then you can also get to your particular region. Now, one thing that I've got to say right up front is, folks at Remodeling Magazine, if you're listening, stop including Maryland in in the South Atlantic segment and put us in with the mid-atlantic that's because crazy why would maryland i don't know why but exactly. maryland has a hell of a lot more in common with pa yeah. than it does with florida correct so please consider putting us into a different area but they have the the national statistics and then your regional statistics so i look at the regional statistics that minor kitchen remodel mm-hmm 
68.66% return on investment. So does that make sense to do right away? And the major, even smaller, 53.7% return on investment. Well, if you think about it, not everybody on a major re- yeah. re- renovation, yeah. not everybody may have the same taste as you. So you're that's limiting true. your by doing a major one. You're limiting your buyer pool, and that depends. I mean, there's there's some looks that have a kind of a classic appeal, but if you get very specific, right? If you get, well, let's oh, say you we, wanna... we did really high end, but we were very specific in our in our yeah. countertop and our backsplash and our cabinet choice, and it was what we wanted, not necessarily what the market would want. Or a Viking range, for heaven's sakes. Well, they're you know, beautiful. They're beautiful, but that's they cost. So <laughs> they do much. cost quite a bit. You're not going to get the return investment Correct. on a Viking range. Now, to our point earlier, if you love cooking and you want a Viking range in your home and you want to live with it and enjoy using it for a couple of years before you sell, go get the right. Go get the Viking range. Right. But, you know, you're worried less than about the return on investment than, on, than anything else. All right. So bathrooms, mm-hmm. a mid-range remodel on the bathroom, 51, 55.1%, an upscale renovation, 51.1%. I'm surprised at some of these numbers. but They're a little lower, right? But, yeah. I mean, this is assuming that you're going to have somebody do the work for you, not do the work yourself. Right. That can change how much you get back. Well, I'd like to see the methodology and the return on investment, but that's not. Anyway, the bottom line is what you're saying. The point we're trying to drive across is, A, you don't get a dollar for dollar for most renovations. And the minor or mid-range upgrades tend to have a better return on investment than the major upscale. Right. So then you look on the exterior, siding. Vinyl siding, about 64% return. A roof, about 58%. Vinyl windows, about 65%. So, again, to your point, yeah, you're not on these big things. You're not going to get out what you put into it. So realize that if you do, if, if you do have to make these, mi- these major or more significant updates, the time to do them is well before you decide to sell the house. It's and you know, and interestingly enough, I'm looking at these exterior curb appeals, the ones you just mentioned, siding roof and vinyl windows. Yeah. They are hard pressed to show up on an appraisal. Right. You won't see much. I mean, maybe in the quality of construction or the quality of that the condition of the home, but that's more on the interior it seems to be. Yeah. People will always tell me I got an updated HVAC and I'm like, wonderful. I don't know how, like, they think that's going to show up in the appraised value, and it often doesn't. What it tends to do is make your house sell quicker than a house. Gives who's people got a that feeling of quality, right. yeah, but it doesn't necessarily move the needle on the appraised value. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. All right, so so there's, there's mid-range and major renovations that we've discussed. Maybe don't give you the 100% return on investment. However... There are some minor renovations, some minor updates, some tweaks. Especially, let's call them. The, and a lot of these are things that you could do yourself yeah. if you had the time. Absolutely. So tweaks that can actually have a really decent amount of return on your investment. So let's talk about painting the house. How about painting the front door? Well, we'll get to that in a second. <laughs> You always say that's such a good return on investment. It is a huge return on investment. All right. All right we'll talk start. about that. Zillow put a report out, and we talked about this in, in a previous podcast, yes, too. Zillow put out a report that said if you paint your door black, in it's it's contributed to up to over $6,000 in value on the price of the home. Now, that's all other things being equal and right. And what was Zillow's methodology? I'm not sure, but right. they're, you know, hey, a black door. The other, the other color, by the way, that seems to be really popular in addition to black is like a slate blue. Okay, that's I another like, good I can mo- see that one. Yeah, versus a pale pink door, which has the exact opposite effect. <laughs> so, if you're thinking about door colors, that's interesting. Blues and blacks. Think of bruise. Don't think. <laughs> don't think pink. <laughs> but anyway, all right. So painting. Yes. Home light did a survey. They painting your home can have an ROI of up to 107%. Wow. 
There you go, 107%. Painting, almost any house we go into, we talk to clients and we're almost always we're talking about paint and either carpet or floor refinish. There's little things on paint. So I can give you an example. I had our house painted and it wasn't very much longer after our house was painted. The yeah. kid spilled something and never said anything to me. And I, it's <laughs> it's it's there and I can't get it off the paint. Right. I'll probably have to repaint it. Paint it, it. yeah. But, all right, paint's not the cheapest. Paint's gotten a little more expensive over the course of the last couple of years. But it's still one of the most cost-effective things that you can do. looks great. Yes, a fresh coat of paint can turn something that looks tired and worn and run down into something that looks clean and fresh. So it has a dramatic impact. Right. Right. And for not a lot of effort. And is, to your point, Michael, something people can do on, on their own. Now, if you've got the time and the inclination. I personally hate I hate painting. I will paint if I have to, but... I'm not a fate. It's, Every, yeah. Most recent, last time I painted something, uh, there was a lot of fighting going on while we were painting. <laughs> well, that's any home, right? That's right. the test of marriage right nowadays. Is I told you. If the, you can uh, survive home improvement anybody, pro- projects. Anytime somebody's doing a home improvement project, especially a major one, they need to watch Money Trap. <laughs> the Money Trap, right. Or the money pit. Pit. Money pit. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Money pit. Good point. Tom Hanks. All right. Yes. Shelly Long. All right. So I talked a little bit. I mentioned this. Paint and carpet, right? So flooring is another thing that can have... It's not. We're not talking about putting in brand new hardwoods. Well, it's funny how expensive that is, and it seems that hardwoods are less preferred than some of the vinyl flooring is these days. Well, yeah. And I mean, I think that's a trend that's going to vary. You know, it's, it'll, it'll wax and wane. Okay. But right now... Yeah, luxury vinyl plank, LVP, whatever, you know, you'll hear that talked about quite a bit. Mm -hmm. That's a very popular type of flooring right now. Now, there's some concerns over what does it do environmentally long term. So so that whether that stays vogue or not, we don't know. But but that is getting a lot of conversation right now. And it's a pretty durable water tight type flooring. So but anyway, so. When you're looking at fixing things up, either refinishing or putting in new carpet on your floors can have a really big... All right, so uh, going back to home light, refinishing the hardwood floors, Mm -hmm. ROI of up to 100%. Makes sense. Putting in new carpet, ROI of up to 106%. Wow. Right? So carpet's a little cheaper than refinishing the floors typically. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there are grades of carpet and things like that. But but fixing the floors up, again, it's one of those things that, you know, if they get worn, it has this tendency to, to portray the property as run down and less cared for. And so if you can show... Nicely refinished floors or brand new carpet. Let me ask you a question nice about clean that. Paint. Yeah. So a lot of times when people have laminate, vinyl, hardwood flooring, they have area rugs yeah. on top of it. Right. An area rug that's dated, stained, beat up. Yeah. Get rid of. Super cheap to swap that. one of those out with yeah. a with a nice, clean, fresh rug. Exactly. Yeah. Absolutely. And you don't have to spend six thousand dollars on eat- a. Nice Persian rug, right? No, we do not. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. All right, some other things. Uh-huh. Okay, we talked about in the kitchen, you you, know, you could change countertops, you could change the cabinets, you could change... What about just changing the fixtures? The hardware fixtures. The hardware, yeah. the faucets, Especially right? if things are loose or wiggly or yeah. uh, not tightened up. I mean, I seem to spend my entire life tightening up yeah. cabinets. <laughs> yeah. Right. The handles, the handles that keep coming unscrewed. Yeah. Oh, even the doors. You know, they sometimes because yeah. kids tend to just open and slam things, and they right. Have a Nobody screwdriver cares. right there to do it on a regular basis. Yeah, you need to. Right. Well, so again, going back to home late survey, uh-huh. replacing hardware. Yeah. ROI of up to one hundred forty-two percent. Faucets, up to one hundred forty-one percent. You're saying fa- just like the uh, the. Faucets, yeah, not kitchen the faucet, sinks. yeah, yeah, yeah. not the whole thing. sink, just the just that's the hardware on the sink. That's a pretty easy thing. If you have a Super wrench, you can probably do. do it yourself. Pretty, pretty straightforward. Uh, light fixtures, another thing that's you know just simple hardware. Now you do have one hundred sixteen percent. 
Hardware and wiring, but it's not that hard. I've hung a ceiling fan before. I, I have too. Now, here's the thing. Even if you brought in an electrician, right. it, those aren't things. You're not rewiring your house. Right. It's not expensive. Right. So think about those kinds of things. That can have a dramatic impact, right? And and think about the, the when we talked about curb appeal, that was, you know, ooh, the siding, the roof, the vinyl. That Those are expensive updates. But... You can also do minor things on the curb appeal to have a pretty dramatic impact. And yeah, we talk about, you know, curb appeal being it's the first impression. You only get one chance to make that first impression. Right. right? So little things. Put new mulch out. Now, don't run the mulch out. Don't pile the mulch up so much that you've got mulch hitting the siding and don't you know make sure you've got a positive grade away from the house but but fresh mulch makes, makes it, it look, look nice. better and and if you have deer in your neighborhood shoe them away. i'm yeah. laughing because the deer i had beautifully mulched beds and i went out this weekend and deer were all over yeah my mulch. they messed it up so yeah, bad. Well, yeah. yeah guess what 10 minutes and a hoe and it's not and right i fixed it you're back in yeah so make sure if you put mulch in just Make sure the edges are nice and crisp, you know, if it's done. This Plant time some of flowers. Year, I was going to say that. Not only that, I replaced, very ex- inexpensive, it makes the house look a lot better, I replaced my azalea bushes. Oh, yeah. They were crushed. Remember when we had the uh, huge snowstorms and you had ice dams and they fell off the front of the house and, and landed on all your plants? And crushed all your plants. Plants up front. Right. Uh, I just got tired of looking at them and replaced them. And yeah. Had to water them. <laughs> Anybody out there, if you get new plants, make sure you water them. Cause right. They, <laughs> They'll die right. if you don't. But not a not an overwhelmingly yeah. expensive investment to really improve the first impression. Especially this time here when the azaleas are blooming. Yeah, yeah. So keep the grass trimmed. Uh, trim back those hedges. Make sure that the grass you know the grass is edged nicely. I do that. Power washing on the exterior. If you've got like we get the you know if it's I should have taken on a- the side of the home we get that green stuff that builds up because the sun isn't hitting that side of the house as much and so you can power wash that and it looks it's funny you know you brand new that. i did some power washing this weekend when it was before it got cold on uh, saturday yeah nice i should show you a picture the before or and shared after. on your uh, just of the sidewalk oh yeah people, you're talking about the house but people forget how and we have stepping stones leading to our house mm-hmm Mindy had no idea that they were brick colored. <laughs> <laughs> but well, but they that's were brownish the point, right? green, right? So that yeah, that brought the, out the nice brick you, color of them. So when you do the power washing, don't forget the things like the porch, the sidewalk, those walkways. That especially nowadays, really, when people have the update, it's not a wood deck anymore, right? You yeah, tracks or something tracks, like and that. And then it's uh, it's vinyl. What a lot of people have the white posts. Yeah, it's not. And if you're in an area that gets plenty of sun you might not have to deal with the moss growing on it or the green growing right. on it but you do have to worry about over winter the black yeah. stuff the soot that just tends to happen over time right and a quick power washer that makes it look a world amazingly different yeah absolutely and then we talked about the uh the paint in the front door so we don't have to go in that into that again but the other thing that is super simple to do the outside clutter right like your trash cans and ladders and things like that i could never have anybody come to my home to look at it i would never i will never book a monday morning ninth trash gets picked up monday morning 9 30 to 10 yeah it's not my trash that's a problem i have neighbors who have 11 children and they're churchgoers and they 11 children 11 children a smaller house than mine wow that's more than the brady bunch it is a lot (laughs) Almost and, twice the brain. And they're runs. good stewards of the community and that they there's if there's people in their church that are struggling, they will take them in their house. Yeah. Wonderful people. That nice. sounds sound they sound like it. Problem is, on trash day there's four full trash cans mm-hmm. and about twelve trash bags out wow. there. I counted it one time, twenty trash bags. They every gotta go Monday. through a lot of stuff. I and mean that with all those kids and then helping other people out. Yeah. It's an enormous pile and it would look terrible if i pulled up and saw that it's right next to me yeah right yeah so but i would tell the yeah. listing not agent, on trash day not on trash day <laughs> yeah yeah wait till noon on monday yeah good well, a lot of people aren't looking in homes on monday mornings anyway yeah well yeah but all right so the point 
we were trying to make on these repairs that we suggest is you got to look at the return on investment. Return on investment, smaller might be greater. Smaller, yeah, right? So small changes lead to big things. Right. It's Great. The ma- the, if you're going to look at a major rehab. Less so, is more, whatever. If you're yeah. going to look at a major rehab or ma- major renovation, I would think about enjoying that re- major renovation before you listen. Yeah. Enjoy it for a couple years yeah. before you sell. Great point. Okay. Now we're so getting the talk. last part is how we get to pay for this. Yeah, Michael, and, and I think that you're driving a lot of that bus. Well, I'll try my there's best. There's a couple of yeah, there's a couple of options. Well, you first of all mentioned cash available. If you have the cash, self financing is because that there's no cost to that except for right. the the loss of return that you would get investing that cash elsewhere. But you're doing it for a return on investment, so yep. don't worry about that. If you have a ton of equity in the home, you could always look at doing a home equity line of credit. Yeah. The benefits of doing a home equity line of credit is that, generally speaking, they are no or low, low cost, especially if you have one existing. Taking out a new one, let me explain to people, a home equity line of credit is based on the equity in your house, and often they're done no closing costs. Yeah. The problem is you you have to have it for three years. Mm-hmm. If you close that out in three years, they will recruit some of those closing costs. So factor that in. If you have an existing home equity line of credit, because when they're taken out, generally you take them out and you have a draw period of 10 to 15 years. So you could have taken one out. And I, I don't mind if you've in a position where – you have a very good rate on your first mortgage, and you're not, probably never going to refinance again, and you have a ton of equity there, and it doesn't cost you anything, and you don't, you're not sure if you're moving or not, or you're not sure what the future holds. Right. Having a home equity line of credit is a great emer- not It's great for emergency. If you have a job loss, you could use the home equity line of credit to pay your bills. Mm-hmm. Use the equity in your house to do that. You could finance home improvements. And if you're thinking, if you have it in place and it's been in place for three years and you're going to sell it soon, you could finance those home repairs yeah. without having to pay any closing costs. So right. I like Not a hope- good for yeah, you're buying not- a boat. <laughs> don't, buy- <laughs> no, we don't, don't buy a boat. Don't buy a timeshare. Don't finance a 21-day European cruise, <laughs> right? Mediterranean cruise. Do that with your earnings and yes. savings from that. Right. So a home equity line of credit is a great way to pay for these. But remember that if you're taking it out and then you're selling soon thereafter, that zero closing costs will have to be or will likely be recouped yeah. from the bank or the credit union or lender that does that. Yeah. Personal loan. Yeah. There are most banks have personal loans that you can take out. They have higher interest rates than would be on a home equity line of credit. So right. you're going to pay a little bit more there. If and what about the tax deduction, by the way? On, I, mean, I know on we're a personal not loan, you would not. Right, you wouldn't have that on the personal loan. It has to be secure. So it, tax deduction on it is if it's secured against your home, yep. your primary residence or mm-hmm. secondary residence. Right. And you make home improvements. And you related. pay for home improvements with it or purchase a home. That is tax deductible. Now, as always, secure. speak to an accountant yes. to verify. We are not accountants, so right. speak to your accountants to verify, but... So the next one you have is a renovation loan, which yeah. is entirely possible. And then once again, that would be probably for the major repairs that you're going to enjoy for a while, because mm-hmm. there are some these are big, much bigger costs with a renovation loan than there is with a home equity line of credit or personal loan, or some of the other options we're going to talk about. Yep, uh, you're going to have greater closing costs, a higher um, higher interest rate than you would on a normal uh, refinance loan. So, but if it's I will say this, a home equity line of credit generally requires a pretty good credit score. Yeah. If you're somebody with a 620, 630 credit score and you're stuck on in that area, then a, a renovation loan might be the only way you can go. Possibly, yeah. And as long as your return on investment is greater and you enjoy it, maybe enjoy it for a little bit, then it's it's reasonably thing. I'd rather see somebody do a renovation loan, A, to buy a house and buy the, live in the home that they love, or to do a refinance and finance a rehab that they're going to enjoy for a little bit before they sell it. Great. All right. Cash out refinancing. You have a ton of equity in your house. That's yeah. a hard one too because a lot of people who have super low rates, they're going to have to they're going to have to refinance that existing loan at a lower rate at a higher rate to get the cash. So in this market, that may not be as attractive, but again, it might be your only choice if your credit's not the best. Right. FHA allows you to take it, you know, you can get an FHA loan with a, not the best of credit and you can borrow up to 80% of the value of your home. So if that's your situation, that might be your only way right. to finance those things. And then you could use that time uh, while you're enjoying the home to 
improve your credit score so that you, when you sell and you buy the next house, you get better financing options. Or if you refinance that cash out to a lower rate. You can look at it that way. Right. Uh, credit cards. Not the way. It's a little scary because it's, it's, it's the preferred way. Well, some people who have super great credit have huge lines on their credit, and they might have pretty low uh, rates, especially short term. For, or, or I'll give you an idea. I every day I get a cash advance, and I, you know, there's letters in the mail, and sure. you do it zero right. percent for nine months or twelve months. You pay a three percent. Fee. Right. You might be able. A lot of times, you can write yourself a check. You could, if you're somebody in that situation, but be clear because when that time ends, you go back to the normal rate of right. 19 to 24 percent. If you can't afford to pay it off quickly, right? Maybe or not you're not going to sell it. That's yep. once again, that's another one of those maybe last resort loans. Right. Right. Uh, and then you've mentioned here concierge services. What if yeah. there's a way? Well, to... right. Yeah. So there are. Many brokerages out there will offer varying types of concierge repair options for sellers to update their homes. Some of them involve a simple cash upfront loan to the buyer, to the seller, to make any repairs that they want to make. Now, the challenge with that model it seems like it's a very simple clear-cut model but the challenge with that model is that you are left to be the general contractor now you Uh might hire another general contractor to help you but the point is you've got to coordinate all of that you've got to make sure that you know you've got the right people lined up to do the work when it needs to be done and it's a little more involved you're you're really relying more on the effort that you have to put in versus having someone to manage this process. Now, Long & Foster has another, this may seem a little self-serving, but uh, it's an interesting program. Uh We have a a partner, Curbio, and we have this program that we call TLC. Mm -hmm. And it's a true concierge service because with Curbio, not only will they upfront get you get you the money to make the repairs but they'll manage the entire process from soup to nuts so you indicate what you want to have done you indicate here's where we think the house might sell now that's in consultation with your realtor here's what we think the house might be able to fetch if it were updated and you in consultation with your realtor and then they look at how much equity you have available in your home. And if you have sufficient equity so that they can get paid off, then they'll make the repairs, do all the work up front, and you don't pay anything wow. until settlement. Okay. Now, it's maybe not always the cheapest option. And so if you really want to nickel and dime mm-hmm. and find the least expensive contractor you possibly can, the, you know, the low bid option is the only way you'll go, this may not be the it's right option the for you, right. but if you want less fuss, if you want someone to manage this process, if and I'm not saying that the costs are exorbitant. I think they're pretty reasonable in, from what I've seen, but it's not necessarily going to be the cheapest number, but if you want that full concierge service, if you don't have the time, if you're a busy person, if you've got kids that are in five different sports, hey, that might make your life a lot easier. And that could be a valid approach for you to get the repairs made up front. Okay. All right. So we'll summarize this. Let's, so yeah. it seems return on investment wise, minor rehabs are better than major ones for return on investments. And the, if even you're gonna, the, and even the smaller things and can the, have even bigger impact. The yeah, minor renovations, the painting, the landscaping, the little things like that can have over 100%. Yeah. Very, money very well spent. Yeah. If you're going to go with a major rehab, you should probably think about living. You're going to be in the home for a while and enjoy it. So you get to enjoy it since your return on investment is not going to be great. Ideally. When it comes to financing these things, mm-hmm. your own money is best, whether mm-hmm. it be your personal savings or the equity you have in the house via especially now where rates are for cash out refinances and you have to have a good low rate using that. There are other options. Should you not 
you not be at those not be available to you. Right. Cash out refinance and rehab loans, uh, credit cards. Eh, we'll stay away from that unless it's absolutely necessary. Right. And then the concierge services that you mentioned. Yeah, absolutely. Is that a good summary? Yeah. And then the big thing is just to keep in mind, well, what are your goals? Think through that. Talk about it with your realtor. And if it makes sense to make these updates. And we always like to just put data in front of people to help them make the decision. Here's where we think your house would sell today. Here's where we think if you made some repairs, some updates, where we think it would sell. Here's how much time that would take. Here's how much money that would take. Let's look at all this data and see what makes sense for you. Gotcha. Yeah. All, all right. right. Well, Michael. Yes, sir. Thank you. That's hopefully great information to help people understand some of the options for updating that home right before you're ready to sell. When we come back, we're going to get into the Unreal and the Spotlight. And this Unreal is... It's kind of unreal. I mean, it's, it's been going on for a long, long time. It, it has, just kind of popped but, up but, because of um, pending legislation. Yeah. So uh, we'll come back in just a sec to talk about the unreal and the spotlight. Try. back to Be Real, the Maryland Real Estate Podcast. I'm Brad Cox with the Vesta Group of Long & Foster, sitting next to... Michael Becker of Sierra Pacific Mortgage. Yeah, yeah. Sierra right. Pacific, let me... Not specific, Pacific. <laughs> yeah, Michael. Yes, sir. All right, so you came up with a really great idea for the Unreal. Well, it came up. Episode. You had somebody, uh, somebody sent you an email, and uh, you asked about it. And I said, it's funny that you said that because there was just uh, legislation introduced about this. And this is what's called trigger leads. A trigger lead, <laughs> uh, what, what, when somebody pulls your credit, yes, the credit bureaus have that information. They know a range. Of, they have an idea where your credit score is yeah. and when it's been pulled and who's pulled it, i.e. a mortgage company, credit card company, an auto dealer. Right. They have the ability, they're allowed to sell that information to other lenders out there. And they do. Who, who could pretend, yes, it's a big money maker for them. I'm sure the credit bureau's lobbyists will be against this legislation. Sure. The problem is, is how often it's sold and the number of leads. And when it comes to mortgage lending, the sometimes unscrupulous methods by those who purchase those leads. And there's very little control. There are no breaks on that. So, so it's it's... It's the impact for me, it's the impact on the home buyer who is attempting to navigate this very, it can be arduous process, right? So generally well-qualified of- buyers, somebody with a high credit score is going to have the most number of credit leads because anybody can do that. And it's highly desired by people. So what ends up happening is many mortgage lenders out there are call centers. Hopefully a lot of the call center mortgage loan originators are going by the wayside because they were refinance shops and it's a numbers game with them. Right. Meaning they can talk to 100 people a day, they get 10 applications, if they close one of those applications, two of those applications, they're they're okay. It's just right. a numbers game, numbers game. So they'll spend money to purchase these leads in hopes of doing it. What's happened, and this is anecdotal information, it's in the story that you printed mm-hmm. up, but I'll say it from personal experience, they offer or say things, there's two things to do that are untrue or they cannot provide that they'll promise something they can't deliver yeah they have there's no concern about the relationship they're building with somebody or a long-term relationship that you might have with a lender Mm -hmm. so they'll they'll do anything they can to to get try and get an application or information the second thing that's even more troubling that often happens with these trigger leads is that those who receive them will call up and almost act as if they're the lender you've applied with. Yeah. Ask for and get your information, like social security number, address, things like that, so they can pull credit and start a new... They're not going to try and sell your data, but they're trying to get an application. Many of these call center people are paid not only by closed loans, but also by applications that they receive. There's a little incentive for that. The idea behind it is that, you know, more people are offering you credit, the better chances are that you're going to get a good deal. But I asked you a question during the break, and I want you to answer it for the podcast. Yeah. Um, A national call center lender, would you ever let that person do the loan for a client of yours in a local real estate market? Granted, it's not my decision. No. But I would certainly advise 
a buyer that going with a national call center lender is it can be problematic for a few reasons. Number one is you you don't have the guarantee that you've got somebody who's looking out for your best interests. Number two, you have somebody who Maryland has some peculiarities with regard to our real estate, and many national lenders aren't aware of those issues. We've had issues come up with things that are peculiar to Maryland, like ground rent, right. and lenders don't know how to deal with it, and so the loan can get hold up, held up for a while. They don't so, even know the local uh, real estate taxes. Many times they'll give an offer out there or work up numbers, and they're not— And they're even, nowhere close. They don't get the recordation or transfer the, or taxes right. Or how about right? the insurance? I mean, they, they quote the, no. the estimate on the—the the loan estimate has an insurance quote, and it's it's— a grand lower than it should I be. I recently had somebody who was buying an over $700,000 house get it, show me a loan estimate that had $50 a month for homeowners insurance. $50 on a 600 seven? Yeah, that's no way that's happening. <laughs> no way. Yeah. It's all meant to show, because a lot of people just look at the bottom line. Right. And that's, so when you're dealing well, with and some, the apples to apples comparison is important, and most most buyers don't have the time, wherewithal, the time, the knowledge to make that right. comparison. So, trigger leads have a good idea. Well, Richie Torres, a Democrat from New York State, introduced House House Resolution 2656 to end this, to stop the selling of it. It probably was a good idea when it started, but it's gotten out of hand. Uh, we've talking, we've spoken to somebody who had at least seventy phone calls. Yeah, from trigger leads. Well, that's and that's insane. the impact to the buyer, right? They're trying to navigate this process. They're working with someone who they've met probably a recommendation from their realtor or some family member or somebody who had a great experience and they've got a degree of trust and then they get this call from this other lender who's making these promises right. and they don't know what to make of it. Yeah. Yeah. It creates confusion. Now, I get the idea and this article that we that we uh, that we saw in mm -hmm. Housing Wire right. talks about this a little bit. I get the concept that the idea is you're putting, you know, more competition out there and consumers will benefit. Not necessarily. I mean, I, granted, competition is a good thing. I will say this about getting a bit. So when the trigger, trigger leads have been around for a long time. Yeah. Information as far as mortgage rates or what the going rate was is for mortgage rates was not as readily available as it is today. Yeah. We, you and I both subscribe because it changes on a daily basis to Mortgage News Daily, mm -hmm. it gives a rate out there that is for the best quality borrowers. Yep, It's pretty accurate on 30-year fix. On the different loans, it's fairly accurate when it comes to giving an I. It's an average rate because the rate they give, rates are usually an eighth of a percent, so it, it averages it out. Right. And it's low low points. Mm -hmm. Often, they're not, it's very rare that there's zero points, but we're talking two, three, four tenths of a point. To get that rate that's something to look at if your rates a lot higher than that maybe you should be shopping or asking why it is higher it could be higher just because of your scenario right rates are not made the same for everybody yeah somebody with so uh, risk risk is a big risk based factor. pricing yep. is a big thing especially specifically when it comes to conventional financing it's not so much an fha financing uh, there is some risk you know higher credit scores tend to get a little bit better rate, but it's not a big deal with government is with conventional financing. So my point is that that information was not available when these trigger leads just started. Yeah. Somebody's not, if somebody gets offered seven and a half percent right now for a mortgage rate, first question is why? Right. Credit score, is it a second home or an investment property? That might, there might be a there legitimate might reason. There warrant that, yeah. If it's not, if it's a primary residence, they have great credit scores, they're putting, you know, Three, five, they're putting some, some decent down, they should probably be getting a lot better rate and doing a little bit of shopping. And your realtor would happily point you sure. to somebody who could do that. Or he, he, most people have family or friends who recently went through a refinance or a purchase. And if they had a good experience with a loan officer, that'd be another great referral. Right. People can shop. They don't necessarily need the information from trigger leads yeah. to shop. Yeah. So, and the problem is the what he says here, I can't begin to tell you the number of time a client in, in, in process and calls one of my LOs to question the bombardment of phone calls from Internet Call Center, center sweatshops. <laughs> well, the, and it's, that's the point, though. How do you stop it? I said it? it's a number game. We get, we get, 
our clients all the time say, how do I stop these calls? Great There's question. Just so way too many. How do you do it? Yeah. Do you know? So there is a, an internet site that you can go to. It is <laughs> optoutprescreen.com. Optoutprescreen.com. And it allows you, believe it or not, it allows you to opt out of all three of the bureaus selling your data. Yep. And it's a simple thing to do it. Now, you can do it. You have to do it in writing if you want it permanent, but you can do it electronically for five years, yep. pretty simply on the web. And here's the thing. This is about stopping the overwhelm that you're going to get by having your data sold to all these companies. That doesn't prevent your ability to go out and shop the market. Oh, no, 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 no. Not at yeah. all. Yeah. Not at all. Yeah. But it's Great. just, it'd be, be for everything. It's not, what if you... I haven't seen it happen. But I see. I seem to get more deluge. If I apply for a new credit card because of some bonus they're going to give, I tend to get a lot of offers via email and not right. phone calls like that. Right, right, right. But most people, when a credit score is pulled by a mortgage company, calls, most people, tons of calls. It's because it's imminent. Something's yeah. happening. They're either buying a home or refinancing. Now it's not yep. so, it's such, so much as a... And I would suspect the reason the calls have increased because there's fewer loans out there with not many refinances being done. Yeah, so absolutely. There's multi, you know, these People are beating the bushes and I, everywhere they If can. you're somebody out there buying them, why? What's your return on investment? I bet it's incredibly low. Oh, sure. So maybe you should stop and we can, wouldn't need this legislation. Wouldn't that be nice? It would be. But yeah, but all right. we could all live in peace and harmony and sing Kumbaya. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> all right. Well, Michael, thank you. Yes, that is unreal. If you get 70 calls, that's unreal. It's been much. Isn't right? It? It's, it's definitely unreal to the home buyer. So think about that opt out. Not a bad idea. All right. Moving into the spotlight mm -hmm. this week. Okay. We are highlighting. The Mint Leaf in Hunt Valley, Maryland. Now, they have some sister restaurants too, but we recently visited this uh, fine establishment. They are it's a nice Indian restaurant in Hunt Valley. It's in the shopping center, in the Hunt Valley Town Center. You know, so it doesn't, it's not like this huge, um, you know, palatial thing. You, it's it's a storefront in the shopping center. But it's okay. their food is phenomenal unsuspecting but really solid indian food restaurant they have a lunch or brunch buffet every day that's just out oh, of wow. this world out of this world it's a great value and you can come in and you can get as many platefuls as you want so if you're hungry it's it's a great it's a great option watch out for the spice i will say yeah, yeah. if you're not if, a curry you know, fan you, might, you on, wouldn't go to an indian restaurant well anyway. i mean there are plenty of things that you can eat that don't have very much spice to them at all you know have as much rice pudding as you want there you go. chicken tikka masala usually pretty mild in a buffet but there are some things that that are that are a little higher but anyway uh they also that rice pudding they have awesome killer rice pudding so they're open 11 to 2.30 and 5 to 10 during the week. And then 11.30 to 3 and 5 to 10.30 on the weekends. And if you go during those lunch hours, you can get that buffet. They The rest of the time they have normal plated meals. But oh, I love that buffet. I think it's just a great value. So if you haven't been, give them a try. Not on Instagram. They're on Facebook if you want. You can search for the Mint Leaf or you can find them on the web, www.themintleaf.us. Or you can call them at 410-527-3900. Reservations are suggested, especially of the larger parties. Sure. But great place. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, Michael. So next oh. week. Juggling. Juggling. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you want to call it chainsaws, you can. <laughs> Juggling chainsaws. Multiple mortgages, yeah. multiple well, homes, if you want to buy and sell at the same time. How to buy and sell a home at the same time. We've talked about home buying. We've talked about home selling. Very often, if you're a current homeowner, you have to do both some, of them. There's some specific challenges related to this market. So a little wanna, less so yes. than a, when the, you know, a 20 and 21, but yeah. it's still pretty similar. And we want to make it... We want to make it general advice, but also specific to this market advice. So we're going to go over the process of buying and selling a home at the same time. So listen up next week, episode 16, Juggling Chainsaws. <laughs> All right. And if, All right. You, if you want to listen to us on the web, we're at berealpod.com. Or you can, and you can uh, 
Uh, you can also submit comments or feedback. Tell us what you want to hear, how you think we're doing. You can also listen to us on all the major podcast platforms. Mm-hmm. So, Michael. Yes, sir. Now, oh, if somebody wants to if they want to get a hold of you, how do they get a hold of you? Call my cell phone, which rang several times during the recording of this podcast. <laughs> right? I'm on Do Not Disturb. I don't ever do that. I don't want to, I don't want to discourage anyone from not Well, I don't it. want to either, but every time I do that, it messes up our recording if I don't because my phone is linked to my computer, and so it uh, all rings together. Well, you do have to do that. <laughs> Makes perfect sense. Anyway, reach out to me via my cell phone, 443-310-0012. You can call or text that number. Again, it's 443 310 Zero zero one two. Calling. You can always email me. It's my name, Michael dot Becker at spmc dot com. Thank you, Michael. And if you need to get a hold of me, my cell phone is four ten three seven five seven five five zero. Call or text. And my email is Brad at homesbyvesta dot com. And if you need to reach the show, right, you can also email us at hello at berealpod.com. So, Michael, yes, episode 15 in the books. Thank you. Thank you, sir. For the great information. And, folks, listen to us next week for Juggling Chainsaws. In the interim, we are Be Real, the Maryland Real Estate Podcast. Talk to you soon. Try.